Amen. For, for some time, I have had on my heart uh, the subject of heaven, and I've been wanting to talk about heaven. But quite frankly, I, um, I, di I didn't know enough about it to even talk about it. So I've been, I've been looking into it. As a matter of fact, there's a book at the bookstore, and I, I, um, I wanted this book, but it was $25. That's too much for a book. But uh, I kept looking at it every once in a while and flipping through it. More than 500 pages. And um, Randy Alcorn wrote this book. He's, he's written several other uh, really good, good books. And uh, it's, it's like a textbook on the subject of heaven. So finally, I caught it on sale uh, about $6 off of that and broke down and spent $19 and bought it. I've read through some of it, not all of it. But it, it stirred in me an interest in talking uh, about heaven. We're going to talk about just a glimpse of heaven today. Now I have, uh, it's kind of a little bit of a humorous experience I had when I was in Bible school. They had on, I think it was on a Sunday night before the service, they had a youth service. And one night they were having more or less just di different people to sing. And it came uh, my assignment to sing that night by myself, which I hadn't done very much of that. And so I got up to sing, and I sang a song called Jesus Will Be What Makes It Heaven for Me. It's a good song, but I slaughtered it. I sang it so bad. As a matter of fact, I was so nervous that when I got to the word heaven, every time, or at least two or three times in the song, my voice cracked. And I said something like, Jesus will be what makes it he heaven for me. Three times I did that. I was humiliated uh, by that, and I gave up on my singing career uh, that, that night. But here's what made it worse. Some of the girls in the girls' dorm had recorded, had a tape recorder, and they had recorded that terrible uh, song that I sang. And I heard the reports how that they played it on the loudspeaker in the girls dorm that little part about <laughs> Jesus will be what makes it heaven for me well I, I, uh, I gave up on singing but I didn't give up on heaven amen and, and I think we need to we need to take a few minutes here and look at this and I want to read two passages of scripture Isaiah 64 and verse 4 and then 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9 Isaiah 64 and verse 4. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen. O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, then he quotes from the Old Testament and uses that same phrase. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Amen. Now, it is an important thing for Christian people to be heavenly minded, to think about heaven. It's an important thing for, for Christians to understand the, the temporary nature of our existence here in this world that we're just passing through. And it's not a morbid thing to talk about heaven. It is a biblical thing and is, it is something for us to, uh, to, to look at and to study and to understand all about this wonderful, wonderful, glorious, eternal place. Amen. That has been prepared for us. Both of those places in the Bible, it says, ear hasn't heard. You, have, you, you haven't, it, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that he has prepared for you. That would be things, not only blessings and the favor of God in this life, but to understand that God has prepared something wonderful for the people of God that is far beyond anything that we can understand or comprehend it's beyond us to be able to to understand it but there is a, a connection now there is this thin veil between our existence here in this world and the existence 
in heaven. For the Christian, it's just to be absent from the body means you step into the presence of the Lord and into this wonderful place that's been prepared. But our physical frame, we, we can't really, uh, it's, it's too much for us uh, to, to understand it or to comprehend it. The glories that await us are too much. I mean, really, it would be just like uh, us, uh, uh, John who, whenever he saw, saw the glorified Christ, he fell down as a dead man. It was too much for him. Moses, who only saw just the, the hinder parts of God, yet his face shone with such a glow that the children of Israel had to turn their gaze away from him. So we, we, there were just little glimpses of heaven. Just a little bit of it was, was too overwhelming for the, for the human frame to be able to even understand or to comprehend. Amen. So we, we can't understand it, but we do know that we are, we are, as a Christian, we're in connection with heaven. Amen. We, we, we are in connection uh, with, with, with heaven. That uh, as a believer, God is always watching. He's looking down, Psalm 42, or Psalm 14 rather. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. We need to understand that, that there is this connection as a believer that we, we always have with eternity. That eternity has literally been written in our hearts. And we have this direct connection with heaven. And so we uh, to talk about it isn't morbid. It isn't a horrible thing. It's a wonderful thing that every Christian ought to be concerned about and thinking about and glorying in and rejoicing in the wonders and, the, and this, just this glimpse <clears throat> from heaven. Glory to God. Amen. A scripture that we often quote from Chronicles talking about the need for the people of God to pray. If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Then they will hear from heaven that there will be a, a heavenly answer that will come. Even on the day of Pentecost, the outpouring, there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind, there was this uh, sound from heaven that came. Uh, it was a heavenly thing. It was a glorious thing. It was just a, a little touch or a taste <clears throat> of heaven. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And so what a, what a wonderful thing that it is that we're, we're, we're in connection uh, with, with heaven. As, as, and we need to also uh, remember the, the, the fact that... Uh, that uh, really heaven and, and the things of the spirit and to be born again is just, it, it, it gives you a direct line, a direct connection. New citizenship. Not in this world, but now in another world. Now if you're a Christian and you're planning on going to heaven, I hope that you, you're, you're thinking about that. But I know that any time that I've ever went to any place, any foreign country, anywhere that I was unfamiliar with, I always tried to find some things out about it. Amen. And uh, if I was going to India or going to Africa or going to Haiti or wherever it was, I wanted to learn some things about that country. I wanted to know some of, some of the, the things I was going to face and the things I was going to experience. I would talk to people uh, who had been to those locations to try to learn a little bit more about what was going to be there. So we need to learn all that we can learn about this wonderful eternal existence that is going to be for every saint of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The scripture talks about there in Hebrews that there's a, there is a, this great cloud of witnesses that are spectators. They're, they're looking over the balcony of heaven and they're, they're watching. And so not only are we, we just connected with, with heaven in the sense that we're born again, but we're also connected uh, with heaven because we have friends and loved ones that populate that wonderful place now. And they're in heaven and they're, they're involved. I believe that, that, uh, that they're involved and that they can see what is going on in this world. Amen. They are spectators. They're cheering us on. They're encouraging us. Uh, uh, keep going. Keep praying. It'll be worth it when you get to this wonderful place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so we do have this wonderful direct connection to heaven. Several places it talks about heaven with windows and that those windows, when they're opened, that blessings just pour out 
and that the blessings from those windows of heaven pour out upon the people of God. Amen. Glory to God. For people who, who give and are faithful in their giving and their tithes and their offerings, Malachi said that, that he'll just pour out. He'll open the windows of heaven. He'll, he'll pour out a blessing that you can't contain. Amen. So we do have a direct connection with this wonderful, wonderful place. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about that person that has tasted of the word of God and of the, the powers of the world to come. Amen. Whenever we get into the, to the, to the word of God, whenever we enter into the, to the spirit of God, then we're, we're tasting. It's just a little foretaste of what we're going to experience when we're in that wonderful place called heaven. Amen. When you get born again of the Spirit of God, whenever you're filled with the Holy Ghost, then you, you're, you're just getting a little taste of what, uh, of the powers that are to come. Hallelujah. Now listen, you ought to be a little more excited about this than you are this morning. This is our, this is our eternal home. This is where we're all headed as believers. And we ought to think about it, consider it. But there is this, this veil between us. We, we only can take so much. Remember the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus and he fell to the ground when he heard the, the voice of the Lord and there was a light shining out of heaven. And later on when he spoke to, to Agrippa, he said, uh, he gave him his testimony. He said, I could not be disobedient to that heavenly vision. He understood that that bright light came right out of the presence of God, right from the throne room of God. That bright light was the son of the living God, and the brightness of his glory had so affected him, he said, there's no way I could not be disobedient to that heavenly vision. I think a lot of us, if we just get a hold of, of the word of God and of the powers of the world to come, it, it, it transport us out of our discouragement and out of our worry and out of our fear and we understand that as believers filled with the spirit that we are living in that heavenly existence in this world we're experiencing just a little taste of heaven whenever we enter into the presence of God and the word of God hallelujah glory to God let me tell you we've got a we've got a great group of uh, people just from first Pentecostal church that are a part of that great group of people that are overlooking amen amen my connection with this church has been about 20 years and i, I wrote down the names of of a, of a lot of people and let me just go through some of these and they're watching just think about it this ought to excite you to think right now here on september the 4th uh, on this sunday morning that they're they're leaning over the balconies of heaven and they're watching what's going on here at first pentecostal church and are they going to see you just kind of dried up and dead and, and not moving in the things of God, disinterested in the things of God? Or are they watching what's going on here? And uh, yes, I believe they are very much aware of what's going on here. Just recently, we lost Ruby and Naomi. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Now, both of those ladies were so encouraging. You can't tell me that they're not looking over the portals of heaven and saying, Keep moving on. Keep praying. Keep on. Stay at it. Be faithful. It's worth it. It's worth it. Amen. There are others. Brother George Martin, he's in that company. I, there may be a first Pentecostal section up there. I don't know. Overlooking heaven. Overlooking the, the, the balcony of heaven. How about uh, Ed Sizemore and Jim Gibson in the presence of the Lord? Bill Wyatt. They're not alone in heaven. They've got a great company of people they're with. Amen. Tom Carpenter's up there. Gordon and May Acton. They're up there overlooking what's taking place here in, in our service today. Frank Lloyd is, is there. And Fred Ambergy is there. Ernie and Ray are up there. And Charlie Smith is up there. Glory to God. Uh, I could keep going on here. Should I? Yeah, let's go ahead and read a few more. Roy and Cletus were here in Sunday school. They've left, but Roderick is up there with them. He's, he's overlooking with the rest of that group. Sister Sailor is there. Grace Estep is there. Sister Moore is there. Sister Steelings is, Steelings is there. Brother Elroy Gilpin is there. Papa Adam Huff is there. Mama Maud Huff, she's there. Amen. What a company of people. 
and that's just the ones uh, from our, our church right here. And there are many others I know that Brother and Sister Huff and others of you can name their names. Uh, so many other, probably dozens of other people. And they're there. Maybe they're in the first Pentecostal section. It really don't matter. But they're connected with this earth and the fact that they're in heaven. And they are spectators observing what is going on in this life. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm encouraged uh, by that. Now, the Apostle Paul, he did not only have that experience on the road to Damascus, that heavenly vision, but he also says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2, he says, I, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, and he's talking about himself. Uh, he said, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body. His experience was such, he wasn't sure if it was a vision or if he had been physically translated into that place uh, he really he just didn't know and he gave he gave a, a re-emphasis to that uh, he says I was caught up to the third heaven and then in the next verse he said I knew such a man whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell God knows he says it twice he said this it's a mystery to me I don't know if it was a vision I don't know if I was taken into the presence of the Lord. It doesn't matter because it was just so real. It was the reality of my experience. And you can, whenever you read about the apostles' experiences from that day forward in his ministry, the apostle Paul could never get heaven off of his mind. He could never get it off of his mind. From that time forward, he's thinking about it. He's He's, uh, he's considering uh, heaven. It was too much for him uh, to describe. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 23, he writes and he says, I'm, uh, I'm in a strait between two, having the desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. You're just saying, I know I've got a calling. I've got a duty, a responsibility. I'm going to stay here as long as God says I have to stay here, but want not one minute longer. When my duty is up, then I am going to that place that is so much far better. Amen. That I, uh, I was translated into that place. I, I saw the glories of that wonderful place, and his life was never the same. Hallelujah. He wanted to go to that wonderful, wonderful place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There is this veil as far as the flesh is concerned. So much that we cannot understand or, or, or comprehend. Notice in that scripture he says, I was caught up, verse 4 of Corinthians. I was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. What is he saying? He said, I can't put it into words. And if I could, it's too great for us to even comprehend. It is, it's more than you could ever understand or comprehend. It is so wonderful. It's unutterable. You can't even, there's not words to even describe what I saw in this little glimpse of this wonderful place called heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. You know that when we go to heaven, there's a lot of misconceptions about it. Um, we're going to be spending all of our time just having church or we're going to be spending all our time just kind of resting and uh, taking it easy. That's, that's a real unbiblical view of what heaven is, is all about. We know that there is this longing, this desire to be in the, in the, with the Lord in the presence of the Lord. But it's a longing to see the fulfillment of everything that God has begun in us because we are born again. Because we are saved. Because we are filled with the Spirit of God. We know that everything that we experience here is just a small little taste of what heaven is going to be like. And so uh, we don't dread it. We don't. Uh, but instead we rejoice because we know that we've got a wonderful hope that's not of this world. 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God. Amen. When this body is dissolved, God is going to give us another body. And it's going to be a heavenly body. Amen. Glory to God. Similar to the one where Je when, that Jesus had when he came back 
in his glorified state. They, they, they saw him. Some of them didn't recognize, but yet others of them, uh, when they spent a little time with him, they, they recognized who he was. This is Jesus, the Son of God. And so there was a frame, there was a, there was a, there was a body, not necessarily a, a body of flesh we know because he just walked right into the rooms and he appeared in places uh, uh, without having to go through the doors or anything in his glorified state. And, and so we, we, we can't really comprehend what it's going to be like, but we do know this, that when this body is dissolved and when this body uh, is gone, and that there is another building of God, there is another uh, body that is a glorified body that we're going to have for all of eternity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful hope that we have. So when people say, you're too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. That's crazy. That's crazy. The more in touch with heaven you are, if you're going to be heavenly minded, if you get born again. You're going to get to heavenly minded if you are filled with the Holy Ghost. Heavenly minded when you when you taste of the good word of God. Heavenly minded when you experience uh, the power of the spirit of God. The powers of the world to come. Amen. Glory to God. What a wonderful, wonderful thing it is. So really what we need to be is more heavenly minded. More fixed our attention on heaven and the glories of heaven. First Kings chapter 8 and verse 27. It says the heaven and the, uh, and the heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. This is hard for us to imagine. That's why that a lot of times we don't talk much about it. Because when you get to talking about it. it just, it's like man this makes my head hurt. This is too much. This is too difficult to understand or uh, to comprehend. But God uh, who is uh, everywhere present, but yet that is his dwelling place. Amen. It's his dwelling place, but even the whole of heaven cannot contain him. Let, wrap your brain around that one. That's his home, and that's where he dwells, but he's everywhere present. And the whole world and all of creation and every universe and every galaxy, none of it can contain him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There was an old Puritan preacher who, who, who gave this example. He said, this is what it's like. He said, if all of the earth was, was just made of sand and a bird came every thousand years and put one grain of sand and took it away. And after however many multiplied thousands, millions, billions, trillions of years it would take for one grain of sand at a time to diminish that earth to nothing. He said that would be the beginning of eternity. Wow. Wow. That's hard to comprehend, isn't it? It's hard. Our earth is, is a part of a solar system that they say is uh, 5 billion miles in diameter. 5 billion miles in diameter. But yet they say that our solar system is probably the smallest in all of the universe, that scientists are seeing all of these other suns and all of these other uh, solar systems and all, you know, so much more. They're able to, uh, by their uh, uh, scientific uh, measures, are able to see and to determine other solar systems and other galaxies and uh, uh, that are so much greater even than the one that exists here. Think about that one if you can. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Amen. A wonderful prepared place. A wonderful prepared place. Amen. Amen. It says that place is uh, the, the builder and the maker of that place is God, it says in Hebrews. The builder, the word there comes from a word that, that means architect. And the maker is the builder. So the architect and the builder is God. And it's what he said in John chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you. Comforting his disciples to let them know that God, his mind, imagines us. That's what an architect does. It first is, is, in, is in his mind. He first envisions it. 
And then, he's, then he puts it into a working drawing. And then every detail of the drawing is included in that architectural plan. And then the builder comes and takes that and he puts it and makes it a reality. God is both uh, uh, the architect and the builder. It was in the mind of God, the plan of God, and he was the one that, he is the one that is building this wonderful, wonderful place called heaven. Amen. The Bible says a few things about it. Uh, some of our misconceptions are, you know, that we're going to live in this wonderful city and we're just going to be there for all of eternity, just singing and praying and praising God and, and having just an eternal worship service. Well, uh, there, the Bible says there are 12 gates to that city. Gate, uh, the gates presuppose that, that uh, there's going to be activity going in and out of that city. I don't know, or I even I, I can't really comprehend it, but I believe that that uh, the scripture bears out that we're all going to have assignments from God for eternity. Amen. Some are going to be appointed kings uh, and rulers over certain number of cities in certain parts of uh, you know some over ten, some over five different uh, different uh, regions and areas of the world and the universe that is again far beyond anything that we can even think about or comprehend. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I believe, you know, the, the angels, that they're, they're, while they're, they're, they are worshiping and glorifying God, they're also angels are out on assignment from God. Amen. As a matter of fact, the, as a believer, you've got, there are angels. The Bible says that they're, they're always watching lest you would stub your toe. That's really what the verse is talking about. Lest you would dash your foot against a stone. Angels are always watching even the major things that are happening to you and, and some of the little smaller things that might happen to you in your life. You've got angels that are assigned to you and to the body of Christ that are involved in, in, uh, in ministers. Amen. Even in this world on assignment from heaven. Hallelujah. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in uh, thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Amen. The scripture says it will be kings and priests in that kingdom that's coming. Rulers over cities and over kingdoms. Hallelujah. Let's look at Revelation 21. <coughs> Revelation 21, I'll read a few verses here. This is a part of the, the vision of John. He said, I saw a, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. That's the one we live on. Yeah, this one. Amen. I hope you've not gotten too attached to this world because it's going to die. This world is, is, is passing away. It's temporary. It's going to melt. It's going to burn up. It's going to be consumed. You say, but I thought that God was going to take this earth and he was going to restore it and then that was going to be the new. Well, that's not what it says. It says the former is going to be gone and that there's going to be new. How many of you know what new means? <laughs> Amen. It's something, you know, perfectly brand new. It's going to be new. I saw a new heaven, a new earth for the first heaven and the earth and first earth were passed away. And notice what he says. He says, and there was no more sea. That's the first thing that he says about it. No more sea. Why would John say such a thing? Of all the things he could say about heaven, he said there's no more sea. Well, you've got to remember where he's at. He's on the Isle of Patmos. It's, it's 13 miles uh, 13 square miles. It's a tiny little island. That means that anywhere he was at on the Isle of Patmos, those many years that he was exiled there, anywhere he was at, he could never get away from the sounds of the ocean. He could never get away from it. Every night when he laid down, he would hear the waves crashing against the rocks. And it was, it was a daily and uh, a 24-hour reminder to him that he was a prisoner on that place. So he threw that in real quick before he talked about anything else. No more sin. Amen. No more confinement. No more banishment. No more 
That ought to encourage you to know that the, you know, the things that you're experiencing right now in your life that seem to be your day-to-day struggle and trouble and problems, no more. Hallelujah. 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 It's all going to be over. No more sea. Verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That glorious place being prepared, that glorious city uh, being prepared that now inhabits all the saints of God. That place is being continually prepared. You know what a bride does whenever they're preparing for a wedding? It's absolutely ridiculous. They go to so much extreme. Every little detail, everything is perfected and uh, working on it. It's all looking for that great day when the doors open and there they are, the bride. And everybody goes, ooh, ah, look at the bride. That's what it's describing here. That this glorious, glistening uh, city that's going to come down from, from heaven and it's going to come down to this new earth. Just like a bride that's been prepared for the bridegroom, that glorious city is going to come down. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And reside on the new earth. Amen. And I heard a voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with me. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. Amen. It means that he will tabernacle with them or he will always be with them. That never, ever again will you ever be in a situation or a place where you feel like God is not there with me. God's not with me. Now, he is with you. But he's describing here this glorious, wonderful place we're going to be. Uh, we're going to have a new level of fellowship and relationship with him that we could never understand or comprehend in this veil of the flesh. Now we're just looking through a, a, a dark glass. Now we're, we're, just, we're seeing things in the eternal just through a, uh, through a veil. But then we're going to see him face to face. Then we're going to have fellowship with him and, and the time with him and conversation with him in ways that we can't even understand or comprehend. Hallelujah. Verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Amen. You, ve- you live very long in this world and you're going to shed a few tears. There's, your heart's going to be broken. You're going to have situations that is going to be heartbreaking in your life we all experience that amen but in heaven it's all going to be taken care of amen amen someone said no tears in heaven well i don't know it says he's going to wipe them away so i guess they might be there temporarily i don't know but he's going to take them all away amen amen a lot of things are not going to be in heaven a lot of things that are not going to be there no funeral homes no funerals, no caskets, no sorrow, no mourning, no grief, no drugstores. Praise God. No prescriptions, no doctors, no hospitals, no ambulances. Sorry, James. No wheelchairs, no walkers, no oxygen tanks, no hearing aids. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We could keep going on. None of it's going to be there. Glory to God. It will wipe away all the tears from your eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. People are suffering, going through. I just, Sister French called me yesterday, Brother Marvin's wife. She was telling me that Brother Larry Thomas's church up in Dayton, that seven men in his church have cancer and uh, their church is just being devastated by this he said one of the men has been in the church for 30 some years seven men in their church battling with cancer i know god is a healer he heals cancer and he heals anything and that very well may be what god is going to do but if not if not it's going to be over whenever we move from this world into that wonderful wonderful place No pain, no sorrow, no crying, 
Hallelujah. Amen. The former things are passed away. That covers it all. If there's something that I didn't mention about trouble or sorrow or the, the things in this world, every, all the former things are gone. The worry, the doubt, the fears, all the things, the negative things of this world that are associated with this old flesh. The former things are gone. Hallelujah. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Write these words. Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Let's skip down to verse 22 of chapter 21. I saw no temple there, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Amen. Amen. Won't we, we won't be going to church anymore because we're going to be in this continual time of I've been in the presence of God. We won't go somewhere to get in the presence of God or get with other people necessarily because he's going to be the temple. His presence is going to be always abiding. That's going to be the glory of that wonderful place. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. No light because he's the light. For the glory of God did lighten it. And the lamb is the light Thereof. Hallelujah. He's the sun. He's the source <clears throat> of light. That's what Paul saw on the road to Damascus. That was the heavenly division. Jesus Christ, the brightness of the glory of the sun, of the living God that will, that will brighten the heavens. Hallelujah. No need for church. No need uh, for sleep or rest. You say, I thought heaven was going to be rest. Well, not in the sense of a physical body wearing out and needing sleep. It's going to be a ceasing from our physical labors in this world. It's going to be a rest in that sense, but there will be no night. Continuous light of the glory of the Son of God that's going to be in that place. So that means if God gives to us all assignments and things that He will have for us to be doing all over the universe and worlds that we don't know anything about, amen, we'll have 24 hours a day. I don't even know if there'll be time there. Actually, the guy that I'm reading, Randy Alcorn, he kind of he gives another twist on that. I don't believe everything he's, he says, by the way, in that 500-page book. I haven't gotten through it all. Amen. Glory to God. Verse 24, And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all, by day. Hallelujah. For there shall be no night there. Hallelujah. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Marcia, could we come?